Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Cantor, and it's a great pleasure to be speaking here. I thank Professor Hopper for inviting me. It's my first uh, trip to the Property and Freedom Society. It's my third trip to Turkey. It's a country I like very much, and it was an extra added pleasure to be here. Uh, now, in, in, in case any of you checked uh, the internet and read today's Mises Daily article, I am the same Paul Cantor uh, that uh, writes about zombies uh, in today's Mises Daily article. I considered giving a speech on that because I do a lot of work on Austrian economics and popular culture, but I thought I'd uh, be somewhat more elevated than usual today uh, and talk about literature, especially since this is the announced topic title of my talk. Uh, now, I am a professor of English and in some ways have pursued a conventional career as such. A lot of my writing is about Shakespeare and really doesn't have um, much to do uh, with Austrian economics. But on the other hand, I have studied Austrian economics since my teenage years. Uh, I had the great privilege of attending uh, Ludwig von Mises' seminar in New York in 1961 uh, to 1962. Uh, and uh, it took a while for me to see how to put Austrian economics and literary study together, and I'm going to try to give you some sense of that. Today I'll be referring to work that appears in the book that I uh, co-edited with Stephen Cox uh, called Literature and the Economics of Liberty, uh, which the Mises Institute published. Uh, I'm going to begin with really the differences between literature and economics and why there's, in fact, a gulf between them, and especially, it seems, between uh, literature, literary study on the one hand, and uh, free market economics. But I'm going to move towards showing how they can work together, and specifically around the idea of spontaneous order, uh, uh, as Hayek and other Austrians have understood it. And I would say, uh, in some ways, the main contribution that the study of literature can make for economists is to help work towards a kind of higher order definition of spontaneous order uh, to show that if literature is another example of spontaneous order, it can give us some uh, more abstract or generalized sense of what constitutes uh, a spontaneous order. But let me begin with the problem. Uh, most people see economics and literature as very much at odds. More generally, uh, there's a sense of the antithesis between commerce and culture. There's a prevailing idea that commerce can only corrupt culture. Uh, and this has led to a great deal of hostility on the part of authors uh, and literary critics towards capitalism. Uh, and I'll try to explain that uh, by beginning with a very common idea of literary order, uh, which is the antithesis of the idea of spontaneous order. Uh, when many people conceptualize literary order, they think of uh, an artistic perfection. They think that a great work of literature, uh, as it's often said, it forms an organic whole. Uh, that, uh, and that means uh, that every part of the work contributes to the whole, and if you remove any part of it, uh, you would damage the whole. Uh, if you know the movie Amadeus, that's what Salieri says of Mozart's music uh, in that play and in that film. That is that remove one note uh, and you've destroyed the work. And there's an analogous sense with literature that if you have a perfect poem, if you changed one word, uh, you would change the whole poem. Uh, and this is a very powerful idea. I think it characterizes some of the greatest literature ever written, especially the great lyric poems. Uh, they are one of the great models of human perfection. Uh, when you see a Shakespeare sonnet, it's 14 glorious lines. You just feel he's chosen the exactly right word. Uh, at every point. And the sense then is that a, a great artistic genius has created a single moment artistic perfection. Uh, 
Uh, it's as if the resulting poem exists outside of time. It's part of what we mean when we call great literature timeless. Uh, and uh, this has interesting implications uh, for economics in this sense. Uh, uh, that uh, the notion behind this kind of perfection is that the creator is solitary and acts in perfect autonomy and a kind of glorious isolation. That he has a total vision of the work of art and nothing must be allowed to interfere with the integrity of that vision. This is where a lot of artists and the critics that write about them develop their hostility to commercial culture. The idea is that uh, all the commercial aspects of culture can only interfere with the great artist's perfect realization of his vision. And he must not have to make any compromises, must not have to meet his audience halfway. If in any way uh, he takes into account his audience, he's uh, uh, catering to them and uh, violating his integrity. This is why we get so many arguments for government's support of the arts. Uh, that the government must shield the artist from the demands of the marketplace, which would otherwise corrupt his work. The other negative effect of this attitude, and again, it's a legitimate attitude and does characterize some of the greatest uh, uh, poetry ever written, some of the greatest works of art ever created. But still, the other negative effect of it is that artists often carry around this idea of the perfect plan. And what happens is it spills over into their economic, social, and political attitudes. They are used to planning out their works by themselves with no interference, and they think the result is perfection, that they can design a perfect order. And lo and behold, when they think about how society ought to be organized, they are often attracted to the same idea that what society needs is a perfect plan. And this explains the rather curious and annoying fact that so many uh, artists, and even great artists, have been attracted to dictators. Famous example out of America would be the poet Ezra Pound and his love for Benito Mussolini. Uh, but it explains uh, the attraction of many Latin American artists to Fidel Castro. Uh, it explains uh, the way the Soviet regime attracted many artists in its view. Uh, it comes up in literature, particularly in the genre of utopia. Uh, many writers have created utopian visions in fiction, and they have almost always been socialist utopias of one kind or another. And there's a kind of convergence between the act of writing the perfect book uh, and the visioning of a perfect society that would be created similarly by a single organizing intellect. Uh, Orson, uh, excuse me, H.G. Uh, Wells is a good example of this. Uh, uh, he wrote many utopian books. It's funny, they're so, you read them now, you think they're dystopian because of the authoritarian societies they portray. Uh, but he, has a, as an author, was used to shaping his novels just the way he wanted them to be. And he shapes the novels to create a vision of society uh, that has the similar organization, the similar sense of being designed and having a plan. Uh, in uh, Literature and the Economics of Liberty, I have an essay on Wells' uh, novel, The Invisible Man, where I notice the curious fact that at one point, Wells' narrator admits these You'll excuse me, but he's lost sight of the invisible man. And he says that for several days, nobody knew what this character was doing. It's a funny moment, because Wells is the author, and obviously he can say whatever he wants. But it, it, to me, it showed something about Wells. Uh, he was a little frightened of his characters, that maybe they wouldn't always obey him. <laughs> maybe they'd go off and do something on their own. And he didn't want to, as an author, he didn't want to allow freedom to his characters. They had to be part of the plan, part of the scheme, part of the organization. And again, that's the way his mind worked when he thought about society. Uh, 
It's a very interesting book, The Invisible Man, because it shows that what Wells didn't want was invisible men. Man, you know, the underground economy, the shadow economy. He doesn't want human beings who can escape the all-seeing knowledge of the state, just as he doesn't like his characters to escape his knowledge. So there is, um, again, there have been um, many authors who supported freedom, and Steve Cox and I discussed them in, a, in our book. Uh, but if there's one reason for this nasty attraction of so many authors to socialism, I think it's, it's almost an occupational hazard. Uh, that they're so used to having their characters within their control that they, their vision of society is as if uh, every human being should be part of the plan, part of the program. So, uh, I mean, and, and for many years I operated with this understanding of literature myself. It is a very powerful pedagogical tool. Uh, if you want to understand the work of literature, you really ought to give it some credit and think it's perfectly planned and try to figure out what the plan is and try to see how each part fits into the whole. And, uh, you know, I was as much captive of that idea of literature as the next guy. Uh, it took me a long time to think through to another conception of literature, which I'll, I'll now offer, and it began by my reflecting on the novel. When you have a 14-line sonnet, there is a plausibility to saying that every word is perfect and that if you changed one word, you would have changed the poem. In fact, that's probably not true. But one of my colleagues, E.D. Hirsch, uh, once said to me, war and peace, if we changed one word, <laughs> would it be another no a different novel? And you know, that starts to sound implausible. Uh, and yet, there is this liter literary critical dogma that, you know, change one word in the work of art, and it's a different work, it's not perfect, it's not complete. Uh, and yet, when you deal with novels, in fact, it turns out that if you check the public publication history, a lot of novels, uh, some editor changed one word, or changed two words, or took out a whole chapter, the author didn't even notice it. Which is, uh, and again, that's not surprising if you think, you know, did Tolstoy remember every word uh, he'd written? Uh, and in some ways that sounds like a trivial point, just a matter of the length of novels. Uh, but then I began to look more carefully, particularly at the 19th century novel uh, and its mode of publication, which as some of you may know, know was called serial publication. Uh, that is, many of the great novels of the 19th century were published over time in installments. Uh, sometimes in uh, issues, uh, successive issues of magazines, sometimes in separate parts. Uh, they were often published on a two-week schedule or a one-month schedule, uh, typically with Dickens, for example, uh, uh, three chapters at a time, roughly. A Dickens novel, when serialized, would take between a year and a year and a half to be completed. If you go, for example, to the Dickens House in London, they have collections and you can see uh, how these novels originally came out. Now that method of production, uh, which by the way was very much a commercial enterprise, uh, resulted in uh, the novels taking a different form than we would normally think of as the perfect 14-line poem. Uh, that is, we do, in Dickens' case and other cases, uh, know that these novelists did plan the works in advance. Uh, we in, in Dickens' case, we have his notes and we can see uh, where he thought he was headed. But by that very fact, we also know that he changed his plans always in the course of writing the novel. Uh, we can see he's saying uh, uh, one character is going to do this and it turns out the character doesn't do that. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, these novels uh, uh, are a bit messy by, the st by comparison with perfect brief poems. Uh, sometimes, quite frankly, the authors end up contradicting themselves. They forget that one of the characters was married and chapters later he turns out he's a bachelor. Or they uh, 
forget, they forget which political party a character was in, they forget the financial details uh, they put in. Uh, and so many of these 19th century novels uh, do not have that kind of uh, perfection uh, that is often so valued uh, in literature. Uh, there are contradictions, there's forms of sloppiness, uh, and some of this is carelessness, and you could legitimately say it diminishes the aesthetic value uh, of the novel. On the other hand, in many cases, what we're looking at is a process in which, in fact, the author is improving the novel as he goes along. Uh, and what's particularly interesting in the case of serial publication is that what resulted was a process of feedback from the audience. Uh, that is that uh, the novelists were able to monitor the periodic sales, the bi-weekly or monthly sales, and they were not immune to looking at what was selling or what wasn't selling. And what we find when we study the histories of individual novels is that uh, some of these novelists would change their plans. The most extreme example is again with Dickens. I take Dickens because he was the most commercially successful novelist of the 19th century in England, but also acknowledged generally to be artistically the greatest novelist, so he's a real test case. Uh, he started something called Master Humphrey's Clock, which was supposed to be a new magazine and a kind of miscellaneous collection of stories and news items. And, uh, and suddenly he had this story about a character named Little Nell. And circulation jumped from 60,000 to 100,000 in one installment. That's a, that's a lot of installments to be selling. And lo and behold, the magazine Master Humphrey's Clock uh, transformed into a novel called The Old Curiosity Shop. And some of you may know Little Nell was one of Dickens' greatest uh, triumphs. Uh, 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 one of his most popular books resulted. Um, uh, as a result, Old Curiosity Shop is, again, it's a bit of a mess artistically. Certain characters change nature, uh, go from villain to good guy, just because Dickens needs them for a new purpose. Uh, now, again, I would say by certain aesthetic standards, you can say there are problems with the Old Curiosity Shop. On the other hand, it's typical of Dickens' greatest power, which is his power to create characters that audiences fall in love with, uh, and that move us to this day when we read about that. Uh, now, uh, I would understand some critic who would say, well, look, this is what we're talking about, how commerce corrupts culture. Uh, <laughs> Dickens was on his way to creating this great magazine, Master Humphrey's Clock, and we ended up with the old curiosity shop. The fact is, very few people would trade the old curiosity shop for Master Humphrey's Clock. Most people would say Dickens discovered something, as a result of following his audience. And this is what we see throughout the 19th century in fiction in England and elsewhere. That is, that uh, uh, these novelists were in an active uh, relationship with their public. Uh, and they learned from their public. Now, part of it was anticipatory. Uh, they were always imagining how their audience might react. In that sense, they were not working in this aesthetic vacuum that many people hold up uh, as the ideal for culture. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, in many ways, their work improved uh, as a result of this. So the model now is not a model of the single, let's say, divine creator producing the perfect work of art in a single moment of inspiration and producing a work that is outside time. Instead, we have something that's very much like a market process, very much uh, like spontaneous order. We have authors who are projecting a work, but then uh, looking at feedback and changing the work as they go along uh, to perfect it in the sense of making it better without necessarily achieving this particular form of artistic perfection uh, 
uh, that people hold up when they say that the work has to be entirely perfect. Now it happens in, uh, uh, with these serialized novels that uh, most often they were then issued in book form and the authors had a chance to clean them up, uh, correct errors, uh, sometimes write new endings, sometimes tighten them up, and that we can definitely see that happening. On the other hand, it's quite surprising to see how often authors just said, okay, collect it, you know, I've, I've written all the chapters, just publish it as is, or made very minor changes, or in curious cases, actually introduced new errors into the work when they put them together uh, as wholes. Uh, but the point is what results uh, is something that's very much alive and I think benefits from the interaction between the author and his public. Now there's a scholar of uh, Slavic literature named Gary Saul Morrison uh, who is particularly interested in uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and their method of serial production. He claims, and I think rightly, that they truly exploited uh, this method of publication uh, as a way of representing human freedom in fiction. Uh, Morrison has a wonderful book called Shadows of Time, Narrative and Freedom. And I think it's the best book I've ever seen that tries to correlate narrative form with a vision of freedom. What he says about both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy in different ways uh, is that they fully committed to this serialized form by saying, I'm gonna write the book as I write it, and I will not change anything, no matter what happens. Uh, though, you know, maybe I'll look at what the audience is thinking, but I'm not going to go back and rewrite the earlier chapters. And he points out uh, with some of their novels uh, that uh, you can actually see how intervening events change the novel. Uh, that uh, Dostoevsky is writing a novel, and five months after he starts, he reads a newspaper story and he catch, it catches his eye, and he works it into his book. You know, clearly, that was not pre-planned. Uh, it was chronologically impossible for Dostoevsky to have written those episodes, uh, planned to write those episodes when he started writing the book, because the events hadn't even happened yet. And Morrison makes the particular striking claim uh, that both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy waited to see what their characters would do on their own. Now I know that sounds crazy, because after all, again, we're talking about an author who's creating a novel and ought to be in full charge. But what he points out, and you can see in their comments, that their characters would surprise them. Like, you know, uh, you can see the narrative is setting up a marriage. But at the last moment, Dostoevsky understands, well, this character wouldn't marry that one. <laughs> so I've got to change the story. Now, that's the way in which Morrison sees these uh, uh, authors uh, reflecting human freedom. Uh, Morrison makes a very strong argument that uh, there are many novelists. Uh, he actually includes Dickens among them, although I think he's wrong in that respect. But many novelists who really have an idea of fate in their stories, they really present uh, outcomes as fated or providential, uh, that two characters are meant for each other in marriage, let's say, from the beginning of the book. Uh, he sees, again, both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy as having a very different view. Uh, and uh, uh, one point where Morrison uh, comes very much in line with Austrian economics is uh, uh, he's convinced that contingency is a basic element of human life, and he feels that the best novels in body and reflect it. That's why he, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are his heroes, because uh, here are two authors who, in a, a crazy way, let their characters work it out. Uh, and, and they don't know ahead of time what's going to happen, and very much see that uh, as a negative view of life. They, they don't want their characters to be uh, predictable. So. Uh, when you put this all together, you see that there is a vision uh, possible in literature that's much closer to the Austrian economics uh, vision of human life, where, where central planning doesn't work, where you can't plan out everything ahead of time, and where things develop over time and improve over time. In a way, as I try to argue in this introductory essay in our volume, uh, 
the artist, uh, literary artist, is like an entrepreneur. Uh, his uh, characteristic is trying to envision what the public wants. In that sense, he is thinking ahead. Uh, but he allows his vision to be corrected. Uh, now again, there are some artists who are extremely stubborn. Uh, Anthony Trollope, for example, did publish his novels serially, but secretly wrote them all in advance. He would wait till he'd finished the novel and then approach a publisher and say, do you want to serialize this? That way he felt he wouldn't ever betray himself. He wouldn't change it. Uh, he would write it out all in advance. But most of the novelists we think of as the greatest of the 19th century participate in a process uh, in which the public played a role, the commercial public, and also in which the publishing industry played a role. Uh, I make a great deal of that in this uh, essay, that uh, there's a tendency to view uh, everyone but the author as a negative force uh, in the process. And uh, I don't like editors much myself, I have to say. I don't like seeing my work edited. But there are many examples uh, 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 where editors have done a great deal to improve works, and the fact that authors were participating in a publishing process, a commercial publishing process, uh, made their works better, uh, helped shape them up, helped keep them at a, at a reasonable length, for example. Uh, there's a historian of France named Robert Darnton, uh, who's done a great deal of work on the French publishing industry, actually on a Swiss publishing firm that worked for the French market. Uh, and he does a wonderful job of showing uh, the cultural role as mediators uh, that this publisher he studies perform, that uh, 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 it it sent out agents to booksellers all over France, basically to ask what do people want? So what books are selling? What should we be publishing? And at the same time, the publishing firm would go to authors and say, well, this is what people want. You write this kind of book, uh, we will uh, uh, we'll publish it. Uh, Darton found this treasure trove of something like 50,000 letters this publishing firm had kept a very good archive. He was able to study the, the, the nuts and bolts of this publishing process. And what he showed is that this publishing firm provided a real service to authors and readers. It, connect, it served as a kind of, of cultural uh, middleman. And it's, it's not an insignificant firm. I mean, they were publishing uh, major French philosophers like Diderot, they became instrumental in the publishing of the French Encyclopedia, which actually was a huge commercial venture, uh, made a lot of money for a lot of publishers. Uh, so this is the way in which I've gradually had to overcome uh, the attitudes in which I was brought up, where you taught a certain contempt for culture, the idea that if an artist makes any concession to his public, uh, somehow that's violating his integrity. This is what has resulted, I believe, in so much of modern literature and its obscurity and its deliberate obscurantism. Authors now pride themselves on not being understood, uh, on, uh, on having outright contempt uh, for their readership. And again, governments and universities and other quasi-public institutions step in to give subsidies to artists so that they don't have to worry about the commercial public, and that was supposed to create a new glorious era uh, of literature and art in the 20th century. I mean, again, I like a great deal of uh, uh, modern literature and, and, and modern art, but it has not worked out quite the way uh, the, the, uh, uh, the theories uh, anticipated. Uh, and what I've gravitated towards working on popular culture because I think a lot of the greatest art in our world is coming out of uh, uh, motion pictures and television because they are commercial media and some of the very same principles uh, are at uh, work. Uh, when I was talking about the serial novel, I don't know if any of you people are fans of television soap operas, but it's a famous principle in television soap operas that uh, if ratings go down when your character appear, appears in the story, watch out, you're probably going to meet an accident, uh, 
uh, in a couple of weeks and be off the show. And similarly, if certain characters are popular with the audience, they get their roles uh, written large. And I have uh, studied this in film and television and often the same principles at work. So that's the sense then in which I think literature can teach something to economics. It shows us that, that uh, the realms of culture uh, and commerce are not simply antithetical. Now again, I will grant that there are moments uh, when uh, they don't work together and uh, we read stories of artists frustrated by the demands of their publishers and the demands of their public. But that story has been overtold and oversold, uh, I believe, by literary critics. And I've been trying to tell the other story uh, where an artist actually flourishes because of getting feedback from the audience and flourishes by working in a very commercial enterprise. Now again, the, the uh, 19th century novel was uh, an extremely commercialized enterprise. Uh, Shakespeare worked in an extremely commercial theater. Uh, other examples, Italian opera in the 19th century uh, was very commercial. It, actually, when you look at the history of art, I would say it turns out that more great art has come out of commercial situations uh, than have come out of uh, the alternative, certainly out of state-supported art. I think aristocratic patronage worked pretty well in the Renaissance, and I wouldn't uh, uh, diminish its uh, control. So anyway, that's, th that's my point, that I think we can, uh, we don't have to turn to literature or culture in general and enter an ex a completely strange, different world for us as Austrian econ economists. In fact, if we turn that into that world, we can see many of the same principles we understand from Austrian economics operating culture, especially the idea of spontaneous order, orders where things are not pre-planned perfectly uh, by solitary geniuses, but uh, a world in which there's a process in which the market creates a form of cooperation between authors and readers and often publishers and editors that actually works to improve uh, culture uh, and literature. Thank you.